President Biden announces a proposal for a set of sweeping reforms at the U.S. Supreme Court. The proposal comes after a series of reports detailing lavish gifts to justices from wealthy individuals and a controversial ruling granting broad immunity from criminal prosecution to U.S. presidents. Congressional reporter Michael Schnell joins us to discuss. Michael, what is Biden proposing here? Yeah, hey Drew. So essentially what we're looking at is a three-part proposal to uh, in a put reforms at the Supreme Court. The first one has to do with that immunity decision that we saw come down earlier this month. Essentially what it says is, quote, no immunity for crimes a former president committed in office. So right there, a direct response to that immunity decision that really rankled a lot of Democrats and caught a lot of folks by surprise. The second factor here is term limits for Supreme Court justices. This is something that we have heard a number of uh, liberal progressives on Capitol Hill call for this reform. President Biden right there making the proposal himself. And then finally, a binding code of conduct for the Supreme Court. This, of course, coming after some of those ethics concerns having to do with two justices, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas and those gifts and trips he took with conservative donor Harlan Crow, and then uh, Justice Samuel Alito and the concerns about the uh, flags that his wife flew at their home that were associated with the January 6, 2021 attack on the Capitol. So that is the crux of President Biden's proposal right here coming out this morning. Uh, pretty, pretty significant calls. Now, Kamala Harris, the presumptive Democratic nominee for president, is backing the reforms. Uh, the chances of these reforms actually being enacted are virtually zero, thanks to opposition from Republicans. So is this really just election year politics? Yeah, I think it's essentially two part. Drew, A, there's the election year politics. Look, the Supreme Court has been something that has really motivated Democratic voters. We saw that case in point back in 2022, when just months after the Dobbs decision was struck down, Roe v. Wade um, came down from the court. Uh, Democrats saw massive turnout at the ballot box for those uh, midterm elections. So a lot of Democrats are hoping that the same frustration and concern with the conservative bench of bent of the Supreme Court will once again motivate Voters. So I think that's A. And then the second thing is President Biden's kind of uh, uh, embarking on his swan song of sorts. You know, he officially dropped out of the race last week, putting an end, not just putting a, a bookend, not just on his presidency, but really his political career, which has spanned decades. So I think that President Biden wants to secure his legacy here. And so we may see some pie in the sky policy proposals come from him over the next five months. He's not tethered to reelection like he has been in the past. So I think that it's, it's you know, part politics and part the fact that he's on his uh, farewell tour, as so some could say. Publicly, Democrats have presented a united voice of support and enthusiasm for Kamala Harris ever since President Biden ended his campaign and Harris became the presumptive nominee. But behind the scenes, some Democrats are concerned about her candidacy and chances of winning in November. What are they saying? Yeah, my colleague at The Hill, Alex Bolton, had a really fascinating piece out this morning about some concerns that Democrats have that, you know, maybe when this honeymoon period for Kamala Harris uh, wears off and as she, you know, takes settles into her role as the Democratic nominee, there are some concerns about how good of a candidate she will be going up against former President Trump and really in the final sprint to the election in these what, 99 days now until Election Day. Um, there's one one big thing is that she was tasked with handling the situation at the southern border and immigration reform, which has, of course, been a, a, a key vulnerability for President Biden. It's something that we've already seen Republicans ding Kamala Harris on, the vice president on. So, you know, there are some concerns among Democrats of how strong of a candidate will she be um, when we head into the final stretch of Election Day. But right now, I mean, the enthusiasm is very high. Money is flowing in for the vice president. And uh, Democrats are hopeful, but you know, when that starts to wear off, there are some concerns about how good of a candidate she will be. Arizona Senator Mark Kelly has the strongest favorability rating among potential VP picks, according to a new poll from ABC Ipsos. But most people don't really know much about any of the potential candidates, according to that poll. What was your takeaway from the poll and what's the latest on the VP search? Yeah, look, the favorabilities are, are always interesting to see as we talk about this VP spot. But I think what it's going to come to essentially is the electoral math. You know, you need the the 270 electoral votes to win the election, the road to 270. Uh, who, What VP candidate is going to give the Democratic ticket the best chance of getting that? It's going to come back to the swing states, places like Michigan, Arizona, Pennsylvania. So that's why we're hearing a lot of folks 
who are being floated for VP slots are people who are in those key swing states, like Mark Kelly in Arizona, like Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania. Um, so I think, you know, rather than keep an eye on the, the, the favorabilities, because there's a question of, is that just in their home state or is that nationally? I think what's going to be interesting is the electoral map and see what VP candidate will make it easiest for Democrats to hit 270. The ascension of Kamala Harris to the top of the Democratic ticket could have a big impact on some of those closely watched swing states, especially Arizona. Republicans hope Harris's candidacy could help down ballot Republicans like Carrie Lake, who's likely to face Democrat Ruben Gallego for the right to represent Arizona in the U.S. Senate. Democrats are hoping that the possible selection of Senator Kelly as Harris's running mate could help their candidates. What do you think is the state of play in Arizona right now? Yeah, I think what this is a lot going to come down to is turnout, right? And Democrats are hoping that they can galvanize their voters on the ground, not just for the presidential, but for these down ballot races to get folks to go to the polls, to get folks to vote Democrat, because it's not just the White House that's on the line this election, it's the House and the Senate, and both of which are very much so up for grabs. So especially in a place like Arizona, you know, you want to be able to motivate and energize voters on the ground. There is a question of if putting Mark Kelly on the ticket, will that energize Arizona voters even more and help a secure Arizona, a key swing state for the presidential, but also put Ruben Gallego over Carrie Lake, um, you know, and secure that key Senate seat. So there are a lot of questions there. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of it's going to come down to uh, turnout and how energized voters are on the ground. Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance continues to face questions over controversial comments he made about women without children. Vance has called them miserable cat ladies and said people without children should have less voting power. He was challenged pretty directly Sunday on Fox News. How did Vance respond? Yeah, he essentially said, I have nothing against cats, which I don't exactly think was the crux of the controversy here. It was not the attack on cats. It was the attack on, you know, people who can't bear children, women who are who don't have children may be unable to bear children. So I don't think that that response is going to go down too well with some people. But look, this has just been the latest negative headline for J.D. Vance since he was officially selected as Trump's vice presidential nominee. Um, I, I, I'm curious to know how the Trump campaign feels about these negative headlines coming out. You know, typically you want the VP roles this to be a do no harm individual, somebody who can only help but not hurt or just keep things as status quo. These negative headlines, definitely not a good look for the Trump campaign. Now, J.D. Vance is also talking about white supremacist attacks on his wife, Usha Vance, who is the daughter of Indian immigrants. One of the people attacking her, it should be noted, is Nick Fuentes, a prominent racist figure who former President Trump hosted at his Mar-a-Lago resort two years ago. But what is Vance saying about these types of attacks? Yeah, Vance essentially said that he loves his wife uh, and that, you know, he, he noted in plain terms, he said, you know, I, I, obviously she's not white, but he said that she still loves her, that she's a great mother to their children and a great wife. Uh, this is going to be an interesting storyline to follow as the campaign continues. You know, it's always interesting to see how the family gets involved in these campaigns, if at all. Clearly, Usha Vance being pulled in here. So definitely something to keep an eye on. But J.D. Vance pushing back on those attacks and standing by his wife. The richest person in the world, Elon Musk, continues his foray into partisan flamethrowing on social media, this time sharing an AI-generated video of Harris calling the VP an extinctionist over comments she made about climate change. Musk owns X, where he seems to be spending a lot of his time lately promoting right-wing conspiracies. Is Musk having an actual impact on our politics in the presidential race? I mean, I think it's hard to tell. You know, it's hard to see if one individual has such an impact on the political climate, on polls, on who, what candidate is doing. But I know, it, you know, it is pretty clear and, and pretty safe to say that Elon Musk has a very large following, especially on X, the platform, as you mentioned, that he owns. Uh, there are a lot of people who follow him, who listen to him, who read what he says. So it could have an impact. But in terms of, you know, pinpointing, uh, you know, if it actually does, it's just tough to do in this current political environment. And his money could have a big impact as well, though it's unclear exactly how much he's committing to, to Donald Trump's side. Republicans are coming to Donald Trump's defense after comments last week where Trump said Christians won't have to worry about voting again in four years if he's reelected. Democrats have blasted those remarks as another example of Trump's threat to democracy. How are Republicans responding? Yeah, I haven't really seen too much Republican response on this. Democrats, for sure, have been slamming it. But I haven't seen too much Republican reaction, though that could change this week. The House is out of session, but the Senate will be back 
in D.C. this week. I suspect that Republican senators will be getting questions about this, sort of a taste back to how it was during the first Trump term and how it could be during the second Trump term of asking Republican lawmakers to react to the various things that the former president says. So I expect a reaction to come from the Republican side this week when some of those lawmakers are peppered with questions by reporters. But at this point, nobody that I've seen, at least, coming out on their own accord to criticize it. Being asked to respond to things Trump says is a familiar position for Republicans in Washington over the last few years. And uh, they'll be that again when they when they come back to Washington. Michael Schnell, that's all I got for you. I appreciate you. Thanks, Drew. Attorneys for Mark Meadows have asked the Supreme Court to move his Georgia election racketeering case to federal court. In a recent filing, attorneys for the former White House chief of staff argue that the Georgia case requires a federal forum in light of the high court's recent ruling on presidential immunity. This is the latest attempt made by Meadows to move the case to federal court. Late last year, an appellate court denied a separate request after ruling that former federal officials are ineligible to move their cases. Meadows' Georgia case is currently at a standstill while an appeals court prepares to hear ethics allegations against Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who is overseeing that case later this year. The artistic director for the Paris Olympics opening ceremony has spoken out after facing criticism that the performance was a reference to Leonardo da Vinci's painting The Last Supper. Conservative leaders and some Christians were quick to attack the opening ceremony after performers in drag sat around a table with fruit. During a news conference over the weekend, Thomas Jolly defended the production, saying it was instead a nod to Greek mythology and stated that he wanted to display inclusion in the performance. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. has serious concerns over the presidential election results in Venezuela over the weekend. Making remarks in Tokyo, Blinken said the results announced do not reflect the will or the votes of the Venezuelan people. Current President Nicolas Maduro, who was projected to lose, claimed an early victory in the election, while his challenger, Edmundo Gonzalez, also announced he won with more votes, setting up a high-stakes standoff. The Venezuelan Election Council has formally declared President Maduro has won, handing him a third six-year term despite multiple exit polls showing Gonzalez was the leading candidate. The presidential race in Venezuela comes at a crucial time for the country after it faced the worst economic collapse in recent history. The economy shrunk 71 percent from 2012 to 2020, according to the International Monetary Fund. Several foreign governments, including the United States and European Union, have held off recognizing the election results. The U.S. and Japan have announced a new military command structure set to counter Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific. The move will shift more U.S. operations toward Japan and more closely integrate the forces of both nations. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin were in Japan over the weekend, and the changes were announced after the two met with their Japanese counterparts. Japan has emerged as one of the most important allies for the U.S. in the Indo-Pacific as Washington looks to curtail China in the region. The agreement includes greater cooperation between the Tokyo and Washington defense industries and advanced technology development, along with increased exercises among regional allies. That's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Drew Petromo. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.